All right, hello, it is time for Leak Code Contest 202, and I know I'm a bit late, but in this video, I'll be doing the contest and then explaining the solutions to all four problems. Well, okay, I think this contest was a bit easier than expected, or at least easier than average, but uh, I didn't do so well, I guess, because I got a hecking lot of bugs on problem 4. I got 6 wrong submissions and this is partly because I was just so frustrated at the problem. Um, I'll get to that later when I explain the solution to problem 4. But you know I got a lot of wrong submissions and that that's not very good. But especially because this contest was easy, I think I should have solved these problems. I mean okay I think I solved them relatively quickly but especially problem 4. I think it was too easy. I think it was too easy to be solved in and as long as I took to solve it. So yeah, I guess we'll just get started with explaining the solutions. Problem one, three consecutive odds. Given an integer array r, return true if there are three consecutive odd numbers in the array. Otherwise, return false. Uh, you literally just loop through the entire array and you just check every, every three consecutive numbers. If they're all odd, then the condition is satisfied and you can return true. But if at any point that never happens, then you return false. So yeah, that is a pretty simple problem, it's just brute force. Problem two, minimum operations to make array equal. You have an array r of length n where ri equals two times i plus one for all valid values of i. In one operation, you can select two indices x and y where they are between zero and n and subtract one from rx and add one to ry. The goal is to make all the elements of the array equal. It is guaranteed that all elements of the array can be made equal using some operations. Given an integer n, the length of the array, return the minimum number of operations needed to make all elements of the array equal. So um, you can see the code here is pretty short. I can't offer a rigorous proof to the algorithm, and that's something you, you see very often. You implement something, uh, it works, and you wonder why it works. So I, I guess I'll just draw it out. For a bit. Um, so, so we have this array. So, for example, if, if it's 6, we have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. So, you would expect that the best you would be able to do is to make all elements of the array equal to the average value. So, the average value of, of this array um, would be 6. So, you would expect that making all of them 6 is the fastest way to make them all equal. And that would be correct, but I don't have a rigorous proof as to I don't have a rigorous proof as to why, um, but I just know that it, that it works. Uh, so to make all of them six, we can see that we can take these in pairs because each move we we change two of the numbers. So these pairs are going to be numbers that are the same distance from the average value. So if the average value of six is six, we can just take, for example, um, five and seven because they're equidistant from six. So that's going to take one move. And then for um, three and nine, that's going to be another pair. Oop. That's going to be another pair, um, and that's going to have a distance of three. And then similarly for one and eleven, that's going to have a distance of five. Um, and you can just convince yourself that making all of them equal to the average is the best strategy. And then once you implement it, it's pretty simple to implement. Uh, there's there's probably a really uh, you can you can actually use the formula to do this, but I mean, n is only up to 10 to the 4, so you could do a linear algorithm. And I was wondering, why is it 10 to the 4, right? Because the input is 10 to the 4. Um, why don't they just make it 10 to the 5? So I was wondering if it was like an n root n or something, but but it wasn't. Uh, it was just really simple, I guess, intuition, intuition and a little bit of implementation. So the average value is just n. You loop through the first half of the array and then take the sum of the differences. Problem three, magnetic force between two balls. In universe Earth C113, Rick discovered an, a special form of magnetic force between two balls if they are put in his new invented basket. Rick has n empty baskets, the ith basket is in position i, Morty has m balls and needs to distribute the balls into the baskets such that the minimum magnetic force between any two balls is maximum. Rick stated that the magnetic force between any two balls um, at positions x and y is the absolute value of the difference between x and y. Given the integer array position and the integer m, return the required force. 
And by required force, I'm guessing they mean the maximum value of the minimum magnetic force, because required force doesn't really make any sense. So that's, okay, so for the solution, I was thinking about this for a bit, and then I was thinking, why don't we try binary search, right? So we can binary search for the minimum distance. Um, and since the since the input has n up to 10 to the 5, n log n totally works. So we can binary search for the distance. And I guess to test if a distance works or not, you can just try to distribute the balls. So you just want the balls, um, you just need the balls to be a minimum distance apart, uh, given a minimum distance, because we're binary searching on the minimum distance. So to see if a minimum distance works, we just place balls um, along the baskets such that they are at least distance minimum distance apart um, and if we can we if we can do this for all the balls if we can place them in all baskets such that the minimum distance um, is greater than is greater than or equal to the the current minimum distance or our given minimum distance then we know this is possible and for the binary search we can just search in the upper interval but if we can't do that if if we have to extend beyond the, the available number of baskets so that their minimum distance is, is greater than or equal to the given amount, then we know we can't do it. So uh, we do this using a greedy algorithm. So I guess I guess I could draw it out. So so if there's baskets uh, over here, 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 uh, and over here, here, and over here, and the minimum distance is two, Okay, so for the, our greedy algorithm, we could just place a ball here. If this is a distance of two, if this is greater than or equal to two, we can place a ball here. Uh, if this distance is less than two, then we can't place a ball here, and then we just have to go to the next one. The next available basket, right? Um, so we place it here, and then we see if this is greater than or equal to two, then we can do it, but if it's not, then we can't. And then we just go to the next one, um, and this is available. So at the end, once we reach the end, if we placed all M balls, then we know this is possible for the current distance. And then we just do our binary search, uh, starting with a low of zero and a high value of, I don't know, you just need to pick an arbitrarily large high value that isn't too high. But it doesn't really matter because n log n, log n is going to be small. Um, just, yeah, just binary search on the minimum distance between the balls and, yeah, find the highest available one. So techniques for this problem are binary search. Okay, problem four. Minimum number of days to eat n oranges. There are n oranges in the kitchen, and you decided to eat some of these oranges every day as follows. Eat one orange, or if the number of remaining oranges is divisible by two, then you can eat n over two oranges, or if the number of remaining oranges is divisible, is divisible by three, then you can eat two times n over three oranges. You can only choose one of the actions per day. Return the minimum number of days to eat n oranges. Okay, so essentially what you can do is you can decrease the number of oranges by one, divide it by two, or divide it by three. And okay, so if you look at if you look over here, you can see that there's a lot of wrong submissions, and I'm guessing most of those are from either time limit exceeded or memory issues. At first, you go like, okay, this is totally possible. We can just use dp. But then you look at the size of n, and it's up to two times ten to the nine. So you either have to have a log n or root n or a constant time solution, and and that's pretty pretty difficult to do if you're going to do dp, but you can do DP in such a way that it reduces numbers as quickly as possible. Um, and in this case, we reduce it logarithmically, or we, we use decaying exponentiation, if that's a term. Um, so essentially, if we have a number, okay, so if we're given the number 12, we can break it down into either six, um, that's dividing by two, or we can break it down into, into four. Uh, yeah, so we can have these two numbers, or we could do 11, but 11 is going to be worse than 6 or 4 because dividing by 2 or 3 is always going to be better um, than subtracting by 1 and ending up at a weird number. And to prove this, I mean, I don't, I don't really think we can prove this, but I don't know. If you can, if you can jump directly to a very small number, I think that's, that's always going to be better than jumping to like a prime number or a number that isn't divisible by 2 or 3. So 12 can go to 6 to 4, 6 or 4, but what else can go to 6 or 4? Well, 13, 13 can go to 12, um, and 14 can go to 12. I mean, okay, so essentially what we're looking at here is we can either reduce a number to n integer division by 2 or n integer division by 3. And this is best because we know this is going to be log n steps at, uh, at most or on average, I guess. And how do we do this? 
Well, if a number is is already divisible by two, then we can just do n over two. Um, but if it's not, then we can first subtract one and then divide it by two, and that's going to take two steps. Okay, and then if it's already divisible by three, then we can just do n over three. If it's not, if it's one mod three, then we can first subtract one and then divide it by three. If it's two mod three, we can subtract two and then divide it by three. So the idea here is that we can basically reduce a number to dividing by two or dividing by three by subtracting ones first. And this is optimal because it's going to be log n. And that's basically what we do here. Uh, we just add n mod two plus the integer division by two because that handles all the cases pretty nicely. It just tells us how many times we need to subtract ones and then it adds on the integer division remainder. We also need to consider dividing by three because that could be potentially faster than dividing by two. Um, so we also need to consider that. And the, at the end, we need to add one because our current step involves one extra step. Um, even if we don't have to subtract ones first, the action of dividing by two or three, that's going to take one extra step. Uh, and this is this is just the DP, I guess. And yeah, then we just return it. And we know this is possible because we're going to be getting at pretty small values pretty quickly. So 10 to the nine is going to quickly diminish to 10 to the six. And at that point, the numbers still aren't going to be very close together, but they're going to be they're going to be not not too large so that we can still maintain a DP table. And first, I tried making an actual DP table using a dictionary. Um, you can't make an array because an array of 10 to the 9 would just be way too big. It would cause a memory error. Uh, at first, I tried a dictionary or a map. That didn't work. So I just used built-in Python function caching method. And that worked. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. But I did get six wrong submissions. And yeah, the reason for that was I tried to implement my own DP solutions. And I didn't. I didn't consider that n was going to be so large and going to mess up the TLEs. And also, if you try one of my previous sub submissions on like the larger values, they work when you uh, do run code, but they don't when you press submit. I think, I think that's something I'd like to see um, be more consistent, so that people can actually like test if their submissions run within the given time limit, or maybe just like the submit time constraints are like a lot tighter than the run code time constraints. But I think they should be the same during a contest because the contest should get accurate feedback about your your code. So yeah, I I think I think those might have been more uh, more convoluted solutions, more difficult to understand, and I'm sorry about that. But I hope I hope they helped at least a little bit, and you got something from them. So that was Lee Code Weekly Contest 202 and the explanations for this contest. So I hope you got something from this video, and thank you for watching. Goodbye.